In the year 1912, a young boy named Leslie Arthur Julian Hutchinson sat at this organ in this church and played for the Sunday service when the usual organist, his father, became suddenly ill. Leslie was only 12 years old, but he knew the service backwards. And although his feet barely touched the organ's pedal, he played with great poise and never once glanced at his hands. This was to be the first public performance of many performances that earned him the title superstar and made him a legend in the musical world of the 20th century. There are so many kinds of riches and only one of them is gold. The wealth you miss. Leslie Hutchinson, universally known as Hutch, was born on March 7, 1900, in the small fishing village of Gorve, which is on the west coast of the island of Grenada. His parents, George and Marion Hutchinson, had two sons, first Leslie and then Ivan. Their father, George, was a merchant with a store on Main Street, and one of the items he sold was hats. He soon became known as Hutch the Hatter. The Hutchinson family attended service in the Anglican Church in Gorve, where George was the usual organist. And it was here that Leslie first performed publicly. All the best things in life are free. Stand in my shoes. Imagine the year 1912. Leslie Hutch Hutchinson is just a boy of 12 then. And he and his brother Ivan spent many, many hours swimming, fishing, spare fishing, taught by their father, George. And Leslie particularly liked collecting seashells just like this one. Never did he dream at that point that he would go on to become a famous superstar, taking London, Paris, India, the continent by storm. He performed his music to all kinds of audiences, starting out in Harlem in New York, and eventually ending up in Paris. It was an incredible experience. And this man, Leslie Hutch Hutchinson, overcame tremendous obstacles to take his place at the head of the musical world of the 1930s. Times have changed, and we've all 
button, rewound the clock. At the age of eight, Leslie was guided by his mother to take piano lessons. He was talented, clever, funny, and very handsome. These attributes all served him well in later years on his climb to fortune and fame. Leslie Hutchinson had such an intriguing and fascinating life that author Charlotte Breeze spent eight years researching it. The result was the biography of a legend of the 20th century. Recently, I had the pleasure of speaking with Charlotte about her book, Hutch. Charlotte Breeze, author of the book, Hutch, a biography. You've been to Grenada many times, uh, connected with this work that you've done and what you are now doing. Charlotte, welcome back to Grenada. Oh, that's so kind, thank you. Now, as author of the book, when exactly did you get the idea to write this book and why did you feel inclined to write such a book? Well, initially I didn't at all. I knew who Hutch was. I don't think anybody in England, um, more or less my age upwards, I think from about the age of 50, everybody in England knows who Hutch is still. And they would have known him a great deal better, of course, of my, my parents' generation. Um, but our generation still knew him. And I just missed him in 1969 when he played at some party and I wasn't allowed out of school for it, I remember. And that must have been literally six months before his death. So we missed each other, really. Um, but I first had the idea from a man called David Henniker, who was a great composer and a great friend of my family. And he had long ago promised Hutch that he'd write a book about him. So he rang me from uh, Dublin and said, I'm coming to London and I'd like to have lunch with you. And I want to persuade you to write a book about Hutch. So I said, David, I'd be delighted to have lunch with you, but I can tell you now, I will not be writing a book about Hutch. <laughs> anyway, we had lunch and he started me off and I said to him, what I'll do is to research for three months. And in that three months, I will see how I feel about it, and I will make careful notes, and we'll hand it on to somebody who is going to be a proper biographer. And that's going to do very much better than me, because I planned a fourth child, I planned to move to the country, I was working quite hard as an editor, I had a, you know, a bunch of life and travelling to do. And after three months, I rang him back, and I said I wouldn't give this up for the world. I have never known such extraordinary reactions to a man's name, and I found it completely fascinating. And I have done ever since, and I still do. How long did it take you to complete the work? About eight years altogether, and I suppose it's now about seven or eight years since the uh, hardback was published, and about five since the paperback was published, and then I brought it back here to the University of the West Indies to launch it. But there have been so many reasons why Hutch hasn't really taken hold as a national figure in Grenada that I've always been very concerned about it because I, he's so incredibly well known in England, still in Europe, uh, quite well known in the jazz scene to do with the Harlem greats. He is well known in Paris. He is well known in India, particularly in Calcutta. And I'm the one who knows all this because I traveled to research it and to talk to people about him. And he was an extremely enigmatic and complicated and, if you like, charismatic figure too. And I did find him as a human being absolutely riveting and as a performer very interesting too. And I had to learn about a lot of things I knew nothing about. I had to learn a lot about the social life, if you will, of the 20th century and really from 1900 when Hutch was born here through to 1969 when he died in London. It became a history, a social history and something of a history of racism perhaps as well uh, which was a subject I felt very strongly about and so alongside all the entertainment business there were these very serious underlying issues yes. and one of them I felt was that he had wanted to be Grenadian not wanted to be Grenadian, had failed completely to complete a, a life here. And had he not died at 69, I wouldn't have been very surprised if I'd been writing his life if he hadn't turned up here in, at 70 to retire. 
Who do you think may have been the driving force that got him started on his career once he got to, to, to the UK? I'm tempted to say it was mostly Hutch himself. I think he did have an extraordinary charm and magnetism and people longed to help him. He also had a kind of little boy lost which was slightly phony um, <laughs> as so many men do who are extremely good looking yes. and throw their hands in the air and say somebody please do this for me. <laughs> and of course there were queues of people longing to. Yes. So you, you, know, you, could, you could pinpoint all sorts of girlfriends. You could say that thereafter he'd been very lucky. Uh, with the people that he knew, the contacts that he'd made when he was in Harlem, uh, mostly amongst rich white people who he played for then. He was a friend of the Vanderbilts. Mm -hmm. He was a, therefore a friend of the Prince of Wales. Um, it looks like Edwina Mountbatten probably sent him to the Spanish court in 1923 to play for her, her husband's cousin, Queen Ina, and teach her the Charleston and teach the children to play the piano. Then he went to Paris and you know, hey presto, half of Harlem was there already. So, and then he was introduced to Cole Porter by Bricktop, who'd been a friend in New York. And he, the Prince of Wales was also there, so there was more Charleston and more parties, and then off he went to Venice. And then he arrived in London finally in 1926. And he was then invited, I think, deliberately by Edwina Mountbatten um, and probably Charles Cochrane, the impresario. But Charles Cochrane also would have known him in Harlem and Paris. It's surprising how close New York and Paris and London all were yes. uh, for the very rich and the entertainers of those days. You are now back in Grenada after many, many years and you are uh, introducing a documentary um, activity for um, showing the Grenadian public and hopefully internationally the life of this very famous personality. What made you decide to go in this direction? Well, originally um, a company from Chicago who now call themselves the Let's Do It Productions after one of Hutch's favorite songs um, approached me and said they wanted to make a film and they offered me the usual percentage or whatever you get if you're the author and I said no thank you very much I'd far rather be part of it so here I am part of it and um, that suits me much better really than having a, a cut and being completely not part of it having said which just as you have to leave the publishers to publish your book when you've done it and to edit it so also you must leave the film I'm forced to leave the film um, for to the film company to edit it and to publish it and distribute it. I, I know that it's going to work well for the BBC in England. I expect it'll work well on American television too. I'm hoping it might go to India and probably to Kenya and to many, Hong Kong probably, all the places where Hutch was famous because it's as much a story of the times yes. as it is a story of this man. And yes, as I've said, I am determined that Grenada will know him and it has been at the back of my head for some while that I wouldn't be bad at being instrumental in insisting on it. Firstly, there are the variety posters and sometimes Hutch would be entertaining as many as three and a half thousand people in an auditorium. And actually he was amazingly brave during the war when he used to keep them uh, during the air raids. He would talk to them and sing There'll Always Be in England or The Land of Hope and Glory or something and keep them safe in their seats rather than running into the streets during the air raids. And he also used to go down into the um, undergrounds and sing for people for free to keep them calm. And actually it was brave because he was frightened, as everybody was. But he, of course, being Hutch, was particularly frightened. But he was very brave and he did it. So these are the variety posters of the day, probably mostly 1930s, I should think. And then here's a bit of publicity from the book with a whole bunch of pictures that appear in the book. And here are some of his record covers. It's nice, isn't it? Yes, it's quite late. Now, and this, as um, I understand, he had something like, he, he made something like 450 recordings? Yes, 450 recordings. Wow. It's 